The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Hey, there it is. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Welcome to the bridge. So glad that you're here today. My name is Vince. I'm the lead pastor here. We're, we're so excited you're with us this morning in a row. We got a lot of people in rows this morning. Give yourselves a round of applause. Good job making it to a row, but no shame, no condemnation if you're watching online. Thank you so much to those of you who are tuning in online. And thank you even to those of you who are watching later in the week. We're glad that you're here. Wherever you're here, whenever you're here, welcome to The Bridge. We are in a four-part series. This is part three today of our series. What's it called again? Let's try that one more time. What's the series called? Not done. not done yet. The message of this series is that God is not done yet. Don't check out because he has not checked out. No matter what you're going through today, no matter what you're facing at home, in your marriage, with your kids, with your friends, at work, at school, wherever... If it feels like God is distant, we w distant or disengaged, we want to go forward believing that God is with us, he's for us, and that even if it seems like he's far away, he is not done yet. What's God? God's not? Yes, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Each week of this series, we're talking about one of the things that we believe God is not done doing. We've been looking back at the life of Jesus, looking at the things Jesus did, because Jesus said, everything I did while I was here on earth, you're going to see God do even greater things after I'm gone. So everything that Jesus did back then, we believe he's still doing today. Week one, we said, God's not done. Moving from the to the to the if you missed that service, we would encourage you to watch it online. That was all about how Jesus is after the whole person. He's after the attention of your head, the affection of your heart, and the devotion of your hands. Week two, we said God's not done turning into. That was all about loving your enemies and seeing how God takes people that are very different from each other, sometimes don't get along, and he puts them together supernaturally into a community, and then he gives them the supernatural purpose of changing the world. I got a text this week from a guy in his 60s, and he said about five years ago, which by the way, I believe he was still in his 60s five years ago, he said, he said five years ago, um, I saw this guy and we got into an argument and I threatened to beat him up. I love being at a church where guys in their 60s are still Ready to go, you know. Guys, we can never grow out of being ready to go. You know what I'm saying? But anyways, he threatened to beat this guy up. And then after the sermon last week, he said, I got to talk to that guy. So he reached out. They reconciled. They're friends again. Praise the Lord, right? So good. So good. I heard a few stories like that of people saying, I got to reach back out to this person and reconcile. So, so proud of you. So proud of you. Great job for taking those steps. Today, we're talking about the third thing. That we believe God is not done doing. Are you ready for the third thing that God is not done doing? All right, here it is. God is not done changing the power of guilt into the power of gratitude. Something happens in our hearts when we speak things out loud instead of just listening to them. Let's say that together, those parts in bold and underline. God is not done changing thee into thee. One more time. God is not done changing thee into thee. How many of you know that when we bring Jesus our guilt, our condemnation, our self-loathing, our self-hatred, all the reasons we beat ourselves up, all the reasons we tell ourselves we're a ter terrible person, all the reasons we get down on ourselves, when we bring Jesus all that guilt and it comes into contact with his grace, he does not just erase the guilt and bring us back to a clean slate. When our guilt meets Jesus' grace, there is a chemical reaction that happens, like a match to gunpowder, like Coke to Mentos. Remember that? When guilt meets grace, there is a chemical reaction that produces in us the power of gratitude. God has intended that us as his followers live our lives supernaturally empowered, motivated, filled up, with a gratitude that only comes from knowing all of that guilt 
is all the way forgiven. When Jesus was here on this planet, that's what he did. He turned the power of guilt in people's lives, the guilt that held them down, the guilt that kept them stuck, the guilt that made them hate their lives, and he turned all that guilt into the power of gratitude everywhere he went. We're going to look at a story today where we see him do that so we can learn how to let him keep doing that in our lives. So here's the reality. A lot of us are still enslaved by guilt. Even if you've been coming to church a long time, even if you're 50, 60, 70 years old, even if you've been a Christian for 50, 60, 70 years, a lot of us are still, in some ways, stuck in guilt. Some of us are very aware of it. Some of us are not so aware of it. But a lot of us are stuck in guilt, and we have no idea what to do with it. We don't know how to let Jesus take all that guilt bring it into contact with his grace, and turn it into gratitude. I am hoping and believing and praying that some of you in this room today is going to be a breakthrough in overcoming guilt that has been stuck in your heart for a long time. Amen? Some of us, we get stuck in guilt for this reason. We rarely want to deal with the guilt we feel. Here's what I mean by that. Even if you've only been coming to church for a little bit, there's a sense of like Jesus forgives us, right? And we know there's things that we know we're guilty for that we don't feel a ton of guilt in our heart about. Things we know, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have looked at that. I shouldn't have done that one thing. But it's not that big of a deal. I know it was wrong, but I know Jesus forgives me. We'll talk about that kind of guilt all day. We'll deal with that kind of guilt all day. We'll tell our friends about it. We'll talk to God about it. We'll admit it to ourselves. There's all sorts of times for all of us. I'm not saying you don't know how to deal with any of the guilt in your life or that you've never received and experienced forgiveness for anything in your life. But for a lot of us, we have an easy time talking about the things that we feel a little bit of guilt about. But then there are some areas of our life where we actually feel a deeper sense of guilt. It might be for something in your past that you've never told anybody, something that you did with another person, something you did to another person, something that you've regretted ever since. It could have been something that violated the the, um, commitment of your marriage. It might have been a substance thing. It might have been something with who knows, right? But you did something a long time ago, and you've carried this thing of guilt in your heart ever since then. For some of you, there is a deep feeling of guilt from something deep in your past. For others of you, you have that deep feeling of guilt because of something that you're stuck in today. There's all sorts of things you overcome, but there's that one thing you haven't overcome. And maybe a couple people know about it, but a lot of people don't know about it. And every day you go through your day knowing I'm still stuck in that thing. I'm still doing that thing. And I feel such a deep sense of guilt about it. For some of you, that guilt is like right on the surface of your mind. It's always there. But for some of you, it's just underneath the surface. It could be something from your past. It could be something from your present. But you've so tried to squash that guilt and ignore it and stuff it down that you don't even know it's there. But it's there. And if you slow down and if you pay attention, it will rise. When you're laying in your bed at night, sometimes it will start to rise. When we actually feel that deep sense of guilt, We rarely want to deal with it. I think this is part of why. The greater the feeling of guilt, the greater the fear of rejection. Isn't that true? If anyone were to know what I did, everyone would hate me. Or they would only love me because they were like supposed to love me. My spouse or my kids or my friends or God even, right? He might forgive me. He might love me. But only because he has to. The bigger that feeling of guilt the greater the fear of rejection if we were ever to bring that guilt into the life, into the light. And I mean admitting it to ourselves, saying, yep, that's what happened, that's what I did. Or admitting it to another person, somebody at church or a friend or someone you're in a group with. Or even admitting it to God. The deeper the feeling of guilt, the greater our fear of rejection. You could put it this way as well. We usually believe whatever kind of guilt we actually feel is the kind of guilt that brings rejection. We feel, when we feel that deep sense of guilt, sometimes it's for something that you know, if you heard somebody else was doing it, you like wouldn't judge them at all. You'd be like, I get that. It, I, God can forgive you and other people will forgive you and it's no big deal. But when it comes to you, you're like, well, this thing that I feel I could never forgive myself or God could never forgive me or other people could forgive me. I want you to think about it this way because this is something we're going to use all throughout the message this morning. This is shallow guilt 
And this is deep guilt. When you do something wrong, sometimes it doesn't feel that bad. This is you, this little wool ball, okay? You mess up, you say something you regret, you do something you regret, and you fall into this thing of guilt. This is the kind of guilt we have no trouble talking about. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that thing to that person. I, I made a little mistake here. When we have just a little bit of guilt, we'll talk about it. We'll bring it to God. We have a feeling, yeah, God can dig in there, scoop us out, no big deal. It's no big deal at all. Um, we might, if we work really hard enough, we could even jump out of that little hole of guilt. This is the kind of guilt we feel comfortable dealing with, talking about, bringing to other people. This is the kind of guilt that we keep a secret, right? When you fall deep into it, there's a sense of, God can't reach me down here. Other people can't reach me down here. This is the kind of guilt we feel shame. We want to keep it a secret. We keep it to ourselves, the guilt that we feel on that deeper level. This is the power of guilt. Remember our big idea is that Jesus changes the power of, into the power of, the, the guilt that you feel is the guilt that has the power. Does that make sense? The guilt that you feel on the deeper level is the guilt that still has power over you. This is the kind of guilt Jesus is after to turn into the power of gratitude. But it's hard. It's hard because we feel like we rarely want to deal with the guilt we feel. The greater the feeling of guilt, the greater the fear of rejection. We usually believe whatever kind of guilt we feel is the kind of guilt that if we let it out there, we'd be totally rejected. What we are about to see today in the passage is that Jesus reverses every single one of these ideas. His view of guilt is completely opposite of our view of guilt, the way we feel about it, the way we talk about guilt, the way we see it in each other. His view is completely opposite, and I'm believing and praying and hoping that when you see the way Jesus talks specifically about this, that you have the courage to deal with it, to bring it to him, to bring it to another person, and maybe even first just to bring it to yourself. Jesus flips the script on all of the ways that we see guilt. Make sense? Let's look at the passage today where we see this. You guys ready? I say, you all ready? All right, let's dive in. Here we go. This story happened shortly after what we saw last week. Jesus has been going around, doing ministry, bringing crowds of people with him, healing people, praying for people, seeing miracles happen, preaching, teaching, all of those things. And then he um, gets to one place where there is a guy named Simon. Simon is not Simon Peter. Some of y'all have heard Simon Peter. This is not Simon Peter. This is Simon who was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader, a religious teacher, somebody who was well-respected, well-liked. And this guy, Simon, hears that Jesus is in town and goes, oh, this is kind of like a, a peer to me. I'm going to invite him over as a friend. We're in the same field. We're in the same line of work. Jesus, why don't you come on over? And that's where our story begins. He's sitting at his table. The door's open. There's Simon. There's our guy. And here's what happens. When one of the Pharisees, that's Simon, invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house. That's Jesus. So Jesus shows up at the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, some of you know this, some of you don't, but when they would eat in Bible times in the New Testament area in antiquity, they would lean to the side like that while they ate. That got a laugh first service too. I do not know why that's funny, but I guess it does look kind of funny, doesn't it? They're leaning, they're eating, and I put that detail in there because that's going to make sense of what happens or the, the dynamics of what happened in just a minute. So they're eating and they're hanging out, they're spending time together. We don't know exactly what they're talking about, but they're spending time together. At the same time, in another part of town, here's what happens. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. Now what you can see from that description there is this woman is um, aware of something about Jesus that's going to cause her to potentially want to go talk to him. She's led a sinful life, and we're about to see that that means this kind. Deep guilt, deep shame, the kind of thing that if she brings it out into the open... She risks rejection. She risks rejection by anybody who might find out. And depending on what she believes about Jesus, Jesus, she might be 
risking the rejection of Jesus as well. She's lived a thoroughly sinful life. We don't know exactly what she did. She might have been a prostitute. It might have been something else a little bit different. But we know that she lived a sinful life. And she hears that Jesus is at this person's house. And she makes the decision that so many of us have such a hard time making. She decides to bring this straight to Jesus. Straight into his presence, risking the rejection of other people and potentially risking the rejection of Jesus himself. Here's what happened. So she came there to the place where Jesus is, where he's reclining, eating with Simon. She came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And within a moment, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping. That's kind of interesting how that's written. It's not like she walked over and then she started crying. It's just written, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping. That's the very next thing we see. So Jesus is laying there. She stands behind him. At, right around where his feet are, and she's just crying so hard. She stood behind him at his feet weeping. She's crying so hard that she began to wet his feet with her tears. The water from her eyes are flowing down onto Jesus' feet. Then she wiped them. This is a crazy story. It's a very dramatic story. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So she kneels down. She crouches down. I don't know if she's kneeling or, or like the position on the screen, but she's taking her hair. She's rubbing it on the feet of Jesus, basically cleaning off his feet with her hair. At this point, we don't know exactly what's going on in her heart or in her head. Is she feeling bad? Is she feeling good? Why is she crying so hard? But at the very least, she's, she's kind of brought her junk to Jesus one way or, or another. At this moment, the thing that we all fear would happen if we actually got real with the guilt we feel, if we actually brought it out into the open, the very thing we fear would happen happens to this lady. She is rejected and condemned by Simon, this religious leader guy. Check it out. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. So when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to eat with him, when he saw this lady crying at Jesus' feet and wiping his feet with her hair, he said to himself, if this man, Jesus, were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a, everybody say the last word, that she is a sinner. What Simon is saying is Jesus is supposed to be a prophet. He's supposed to be able to hear directly from God. And if that were really true, he would know that this woman has done some bad stuff and she does not belong here. She does not, she should not be welcomed by a religious community, by a religious teacher until she cleans up her act. And then maybe, right? Jesus shouldn't let her so close to him. Now, at the time, that was the culture. If you were a sinful person, if you had led a, led a sinful life, you couldn't just go walking into a church service. You couldn't go walking into a synagogue. You couldn't go walking up to a religious leader. And Simon's going, Jesus, don't you know you should be putting up a boundary? You should be telling her, go away. She brings all this into the open. And the first thing she experiences is rejection, right? So much of what we Fear will happen if we actually bring our junk into the open. Now at this point, we don't know how Jesus is going to respond. Some of you may have heard this story and you know. Some of you haven't ever heard this story though. And you've got to imagine being there at the time when people didn't know Jesus so well. Maybe, I know this isn't what he would say, but there's a part of you that if you were there, you might think that he'd go, Listen, Simon, it's like my job to save sinners. Right? So cut me some slack. Let me get her saved, let me get her a little cleaned up, and then I'll send her out, right? Or, Simon, you know, she's, re she's repenting. She's asking for forgiveness. That makes her just as good as you and me. Don't hold it against her. Don't push her down. Treat her as a peer. But Jesus doesn't do either of those things. He doesn't say she needs to get cleaned up first, and we'll send her out for now. And he doesn't even say she belongs at the same level as us. Watch what he does. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He cracks his knuckles and said, Simon, you got this all wrong. You got this guilt thing all wrong. You've got this sin thing all wrong. You've got this shame thing all wrong. Let me reframe, Simon, the way you look at somebody's junk, the way you look at somebody's guilt, the way you look at what somebody might be stuck in. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And Simon says, tell me, teacher. 
maybe not knowing what he's in for. And then Jesus takes him on this kind of imaginary journey, this metaphor, this analogy in the Bible, we would call it a parable, where he's making a point by telling an imaginary story. And Jesus says, Simon, check this out. Two people owed money. Guy number one, guy number two. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. There's our money lender in the middle. Both of these guys went to the same money lender for a loan. One owed him 500 denarii, so he borrowed some amount of money, maybe it got some interest, and then he still owes this money lender 500 denarii. Now, a denarii at the time was basically one day's worth um, of wages at minimum wage. So in modern day terms, this guy owed the money lender about $60,000. That's 500 times a minimum day's wage. I did the math. I think it's right. Don't check me on that. I think that's about right. One guy owed him $60,000. We'll put that over there, right? The other guy owed him 50, 50 denarii, which again, if you switch to modern day currency, is about $6,000. So one guy goes, oh my goodness, I borrowed a bunch of money, and I owe this guy $60,000. The other guy goes, oh man, I borrowed some money too, and I owe him $6,000. Now those aren't, neither of those are amounts to sneeze at, right? But what Jesus is setting up is one guy owes the money lender a lot. This is going to become, as we're about to see, a metaphor for guilt. One guy owes the money lender a deep debt, and the other guy owes the money lender a small one. He goes on. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, but for whatever reason, this money lender is generous, he's compassionate, he's kind, and so he cancels the debt of both. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave both the debts. Then Jesus flips the whole thing on his head. Check this out. He says, now which of them will love him more? Which of these guys who just had their debts forgiven will love the money lender more? The guy who borrowed 6000 and had that debt forgiven, he'll have some love for the money lender. But compare that to the guy who had a debt of 60000 and had that forgiven. Jesus said, which of these guys will love the money lender more? more. And Simon knows he's trapped. He's stuck. He's caught in the way that he's been viewing this woman. Simon, almost maybe a little regretfully, says, oh, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And then Jesus says, you have judged correctly. And he flips the script. He says, listen, he turns toward the woman, but he keeps talking to Simon. Then he turned toward the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house, you didn't give me any water for my feet, which would have been a thing to do in that culture. Someone comes in wearing sandals all day, their feet all dirty and dusty, sandy, you're supposed to give them a little water to wash their feet. Simon didn't do that. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. He says, she loved me more than you did. He says, you did not give me a kiss which in that culture, a kiss of greeting was not a sexual or romantic thing. It was just something you did when someone entered your house. But this guy, Simon, didn't give Jesus a kiss of greeting. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. He says, you did not put oil on my head. Another thing they did in that culture with all the sunburn and the skin was dry and cracked, they would put oil on somebody as a, as a way of showing hospitality. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And in this moment, we realize that somewhere between the door, when the woman looked at Jesus, carrying in her deep debt of guilt somewhere between the door and when she got over to his feet she realized that he was going to forgive her completely all of it and all this love that she's pouring out on Jesus the tears the hair the perfume the crouching down has all been one giant act of love and gratitude and Jesus says she has all this love for me because she just had a lot of sin forgiven and then he kind of pushes Simon down a little bit. He's, he's kind of harsh to him. He says, subtly, he doesn't say his name, but he says, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. He says, Simon, 
this is what you think of yourself. You think you don't have much to be forgiven of, and so you believe God's forgiven you, but you don't have much love to give now. Whereas this woman who has had this deep debt of love, or of sin forgiven, has become filled with gratitude, with love, with passion, with fire for Jesus, all because she had this great debt forgiven. Then Jesus told her what she already has been experiencing, what she already knows. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. At this point, we see that there's some other people around watching. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus doesn't even answer him. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Do you see what just happened? We got one guy who lived pretty well who was a good person, who was considered a good person, and actually was probably a decently good person. Then we've got another woman, a woman, another person, filled with guilt, filled with sin, coming to Jesus, and though she experiences the rejection of this person, it is her who walks out the more loving, more passionate, more compassionate, more whole person. Why? Because she brought all of this to Jesus. Do you see what's going on? Do you see this? This is how we think. We think, I don't want to deal with the guilt I feel. Why? Because the greater the feeling of guilt, the greater I fear rejection. We believe the kind of guilt we feel is always the kind of guilt that brings rejection. Jesus, watch this, from bottom to top, reverses every single one of those things. We usually believe the kind of guilt we feel is the kind of guilt that brings rejection, and it may from other people. But Jesus says the kind of guilt you feel is the kind of guilt I came for. Jesus did not come for this. He did not come for the small things. He did not come for the things that you feel comfortable telling your friends about, the things you feel comfortable telling yourself, admitting to yourself, the kind of things you feel comfortable telling God about. Jesus says, this is what I came for. This is why I came to this world. This is why I died on the cross. This is why I rose again, for the guilt that I feel. And it's because he's sacrificial, and it's because he's loving, and it's because he's God. Yes, but also, there's something in it for him. Look at the middle part. He says, the gra- we say, the greater the feeling of guilt, the greater the fear of rejection. Jesus says, no, 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 no. The greater the guilt, the greater the gratitude. Jesus cares about creating loving passionate people. He wants loving, passionate people in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities. Everywhere we go, he wants people that are filled with love for him. And he knows that he can only build people like that when we bring the worst of us to Jesus. Jesus knows the greater the guilt, the greater the gratitude. Amen? That's why we bring it, right? We say, well, I look at the top one. We really want to, we don't, we rarely want to deal with the guilt we feel. Jesus says, I want to deal with it. Let me deal with the guilt you feel. We, we get so confused about this. When I see people stuck in sin, all I see is potential for them to become world changers. When I see people who have been stuck in patterns for years, I see that's a potential person who's going to influence the world for Jesus. I think the greatest leaders of the Christianity of the future are probably in prison right now. They're on the street somewhere. They're struggling somewhere. They're stuck in sin because the deeper they are and the more they know that they have guilt, the greater the gratitude that flows out when they meet Jesus. But that's not just good news for the people that are in prison. That's good news for you as well. Because the part of you that you're like, I don't want to give that part to God. I don't want to deal with that thing. I don't want to bring that to the surface. I've been holding on to that for a long time. Your breakthrough is on the other side of that. The power of gratitude will be unleashed in your life when you bring that to Jesus. The thing that you say, oh, I wish I didn't feel that guilt. I wish I wasn't stuck in that thing. All Jesus sees is the potential for you to become a person filled with love for him. I've been doing these real, real cheesy illustrations lately. I'm going to do another one. Is that all right? Is that all right? All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. What's this? Boo. Right? This is a little woolen ball. I'm not going to shoot it at any of you, although I was very tempted. 
I was very tempted. I was like, I think I can get away with this, but we're not with too much liability. You never know, right? Someone's gonna get an eye poked out, and whatever. Jesus says, zooming in on that middle one, the greater the guilt, the greater the gratitude. The deeper you allow Jesus to look. And again, it doesn't mean you actually have to have done a million bad things. It just means the deeper you let him look into your heart. Because we can feel deep guilt about anything, right? And in reality, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. We all have deep guilt in there somewhere, right? When we only let Jesus in this far, he can forgive us. But how much potential is released from that? If I let go of this slingshot right now, how high is the ball going to go? Not very high. Should we try it? Nothing. Literally nothing. Let me try it one more time. One, two, three. Nope. Nothing. A lot of you are like, why don't I feel love for God? Why don't I feel passionate? Part of the reason is because you may have only let him into the deep parts of your heart or into the shallow parts of your heart. You're like, I know I'm forgiven, but I just don't feel much from it. Part of it is because you're only letting him touch the shallow part, the shallow part of what you regret. And you say, can I be forgiven? And Jesus says, yes. And you go, great. And then nothing, right? When you let Jesus... Not just this far, not just this far, not just this far. Now we're ready for something to happen. You're all feeling that? You're like, what's going to happen? How is it going to go? Is it going to hit a light? Is is something going to break? Before I let it go, though, this is not how we feel. We go, this is horrible. I'm deep in guilt. I'm deep in shame. I wish this was different. Oh, God. But Jesus literally looks at you and says, the greater the guilt, once that guilt meets my grace, the greater the gratitude. And when you let him all the way down, should we see what happens? When you let him all the way in, one, two, three. Can you even see that? It's like dark here. It's the back. Should we try it with a white one? When you go, I don't want to tell anybody. I don't want to let God in. I don't want to admit it to myself. I don't want to say I did that. I don't want anybody to know. Jesus says, okay, fine. That's fine. That's fine. And if you believe in Jesus, you're still forgiven even if you haven't experienced the forgiveness. But when you let him all the way in, the deeper you let him in, the greater the gratitude once you let the grace touch the gratitude. And Jesus knows this. Like as you're going, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus is going, yes, 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 yes. Because one, two, three, boom. All right. Do you get it? You get it? I want that to come in your head. This week. This month, whenever, when you're feeling like, oh, I just feel so bad about this thing, or there's this thing that comes to mind, or you feel this regret about this thing, or guilt, I want you to remember, the greater the guilt that you can give over to Jesus, the greater the gratitude. Let me say a couple more things just to really, really drive this deep. Because a lot of you hear this and you go, okay, that makes sense. I think I kind of knew that. That's helpful. That makes sense. But, but um, so what, right? We have so much. You can come to church for your whole life. You have so much, when you actually feel guilty, so much confusion about what to do with it. So much guilt confusion. You feel guilt, and you do some things out of it that are the exact opposite of what Jesus wants you to do. So here are some things not to do when you feel guilt. First, don't try to repay it. You know you do this. You do something wrong. Or you remember something you did wrong and you feel guilty and you go, i got to make this up to God somehow. Now sometimes when we try to make it up to God somehow, we try to make it up by doing a bunch of good things. Being nice to people or thinking someday I'll make a lot of money and I'll give all of it away, right? We come up with these crazy stories in our head for how we're going to repay God for what we've done wrong. But I think most of the time we try to repay God by feeling guilty. Isn't that true? We think, I'm going to punish myself by sitting in this guilt. And if I sit in it long enough, maybe I'll repay God. I don't know where you ever got the idea that God is repaid by you feeling guilty. What, like, why would that matter to him? Like, if you stole five bucks from me, and then I came to you and said, hey, where's my five bucks? You said, I just want you to know I feel so bad. I'd be like, I don't care. Where's my five bucks? You're like, I feel really bad. And you're like, I don't care, right? God doesn't get repaid by you feeling guilty. He was repaid at the cross once 
and for all. When you feel guilty, you don't get any closer to God. You don't repay anything. That's the very thing Jesus says in this passage. He says, listen, this guy owes him 60. This guy owes him six. Neither of them had the money. You cannot repay God for the guilt you feel, even if you cause yourself to feel guilty for the rest of your life. Does not matter. So don't try to repay him. Just bring it right to him. Second thing, not to do. Don't try to reduce it. This is the other thing we do. We go, well, what I did, it wasn't as bad as the person sitting down the road from me. It wasn't as bad as what my spouse does. It's not as bad as my brother was with that. It's not as bad as it could be. It's not as bad as the culture around the church. It's not as bad as I was, right? So I feel some guilt. And in reality, in your heart, it's whoo, it's deep down in there. But you tell yourself, no, it's really just this. It's just here. It's just a little bit. It's not that big of a deal. When deep down, you know it's a big deal. Again, Jesus will let you experience forgiveness to the level that you're willing to admit you feel guilt. So if you say, well, it's just a little bit of guilt, he says, well, I'll give you all the forgiveness you need for just a little bit of guilt. Which again, how much was that? Not much, right? If you try to downplay the guilt and shame that you really feel down there, you end up just like Simon, just a little bit of love to give because you've never actually let Jesus bring forgiveness into the depths of what you actually feel down in the, your gut, down in your soul. Don't try to reduce it. Don't try to tell yourself, no, I'm really a good person, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. Bring it all to Jesus. Lastly, don't try to rename it. This is one of my mm, big pet peeves. Well, okay. <laughs> this is what we do. This is what we do. We have sometimes this thought of like a little bit of guilt makes you a little bit better of a Christian. You know what I'm talking about? Ah, you know, we're all sinners and I'm just a lowly Christian and I'm the worst. And we feel like it's a spiritual thing to do. We feel like it's a religious thing to do Something that makes God think more highly of us or makes other people think more highly of us to walk around a little bit with our head down going, yeah, I've done some bad things and I still feel bad, whatever, whatever, whatever. Look, when Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, he doesn't say, go and think about all those bad things you did before. He doesn't say, go and make sure you don't screw up again. He doesn't say, go and know your place and ruminate on all the bad things you did. He says, go in what? Go in, one more time, go in total peace. He says, it's done. It's paid for. It's forgiven. Go in peace. As Christians, before you come to Jesus, guilt is a tool of God to drive you to Jesus. After you say yes to Jesus, guilt is a tool of Satan to drive you away from Jesus. More, a little bit of guilt will not make you more spiritual. It will not make you love Jesus anymore. It will lower your love for him. If you're walking around with a little bit of guilt, thinking Jesus wants that to stay there, Jesus says, anything left here is missed potential. It's missed gratitude. It's missed love for me. I want to erase all of it. I want to produce a chemical reaction where I take whatever little bit of guilt is in there, bring it into contact with my grace, and they produce the explosive power of Gratitude. Don't try to rename it into something spiritual. If there's anything left in there, Jesus wants it all transformed. Amen? That's what Jesus did in the life of this woman. That's what Jesus taught Simon to say. Jesus did it back then. Jesus is still doing it today. God's not done changing the power of guilt into the power of gratitude. A lot of people say today, people don't really feel guilty anymore. They don't really feel shame because you're just supposed to live however you want, whatever makes you happy. I think that's a load of... I think we know. I think all of us, though, even if you didn't grow up in church, even if you've been far from God, even if you think, well, my morality is different than Christian morality, you know that there's things you feel shame about. There's things you feel guilt about. There's things you feel regret about. You feel stuck in, right? Jesus wants to erase it all, replace it all with the power of gratitude. Amen? All right, so I want to finish with a story um, because this is a process. And I want you to hear a story about someone that had to go through 
the process. A lot of times when we say yes to Jesus, there's some things that we feel forgiven for right away or that we know we're forgiven for right away. And then we go along our merry way and we think, I'm done. I got my forgiveness. I got saved. And, and anytime there's feeling of guilt, you're like, no, 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 no. That got dealt with before. But the process of changing guilt into gratitude is a process. So Kimberly, why don't you come on up. Can we give Kimberly Dotson a warm welcome. Kimberly is our outreach director. She's on staff at the bridge. She owns a um, small business as well. She um, does uh, counseling for people that are, oh, thank you for getting that, uh, for going through heavy stuff. And um, she's always been perfect. No, I'm just kidding. Right. That's part of her story, right? So she, she had a guilt, grace, gratitude journey at the beginning, and then there was other layers that you had to let God into after you thought you were all done. You were all cleaned up, right? So yeah. tell, us, tell us, just tell us that journey. I think it will be really helpful for people. Yeah. started running away from home about 13, which ended up with addiction and um, just all kinds of just brokenness um, from being homeless on the streets and poverty and um, just everything you could think of, in and out of jail, in and out of rehab, which eventually cost me the custody of my children. So when I decided to surrender to Christ and I knew that all those things, right, that had led me to where I was had to go. I knew the lying had to go. I knew the stealing had to go. I knew the drugs had to go, the unhealthy relationships, even some family, right? Mm -hmm. So I was willing to put those things aside. And it wasn't easy by any means. It was easier, though, than dealing with the guilt of my kids. Because you asked for God for forgiveness for all of that stuff, and you felt forgiven for all that stuff. I did. Yes. I did. And, you know, it was easier. Um, but there was a piece of my heart that had become normal, um, to hold on to that hate for myself for failing my children as a mother. You know, um, I loved them more than I loved myself. And they were the only good thing that came from the choices that I had made. And so there was a piece of me that was like, I really don't got to forgive myself because I'm going to work towards getting them back. Mm, I'll repay um, it. Right. I'll get him back, and right. that'll fix the guilt thing in me. Right. And so, like, so when I asked for forgiveness, and, like, I was moving along and doing things and, you know, supporting my children and all those kind of things, and I'm like, I'm good, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm working towards getting them back in my life. And, um, and about a year in, that relationship had not been restored. And um, so I had had this opportunity, one of my friends and um, mentors, Monica, who lives down in Florida, I had an opportunity to go down and visit with her for a while. And um, I went to visit with her, and she had set up um, just a, a prayer healing session. Um, she asked me if I was open to it, and I said, yeah. And it's basically where you go in, and people pray over some inner healing stuff. Um, emotional you, healing. Emotional and, trauma. Yep. And, you know, and I'm like, well, and she's like, well, just think on it, you know. So I'm praying and pressing into God. And I'm like, God, I'm pretty shiny. Like, I don't really need a whole lot, you know. Like, life is good, which it was compared to the old. Right, 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 right. And he didn't want me comparing that because the first thing he did was expose that place of unforgiveness. That piece of me that still hated myself for failing my kids as a mother. For taking away the mother that they deserved. And I'm like, don't you go there, God, <laughs> you know, like, don't you go there. And literally that was the resistance that I felt. And um, I decided that because I want to go into the healing and deliverance stuff that I needed to go through, I couldn't transfer something I hadn't been through, right? So I'm like, I'll go, we'll do this thing, can't hurt, you know, whatever. So I go and then you know, in the presence of God and just as I was seeking out that healing and that forgiveness from him, the very last thing was that spot. And I knew everything in me was resisting that. And f I mean, it was to the point where of like, 
I couldn't even get the words out of my mouth because it had become normal to me to hate myself for failing my children. They were my responsibility and I stole their choice to have the mother in their life that they deserved. And so a part of me thought it was justified that I didn't deserve to be happy, that I didn't deserve to experience joy or peace. Every day when I woke up, it was like a battle to try to get my thoughts right and to try to get my mindset right. It was like, let's get through the day, and it was work. And so I knew there was something in me that needed to be removed, and, I, and God showed me. He does what only he can do, and it was forgiveness, forgiveness of myself. And so I cried out, and I asked God, and as I prayed, and I could feel this prong being pulled out of my heart. And I could just feel the presence of God saying, I want that. Like, I want to heal that. And um, so as I continued to just surrender and, and give that to him, I remember just praying in my heart and saying, God, I trust you with my children. And even if you don't restore them, I still love you. And everything I'm doing is for you and for them. And I will still follow you and I will still love you no matter what. And so I invited him to come into that place that I didn't want to let go of. And he brought major healing into my life after that. That next morning I woke up and something was different. Mm -hmm. And it was huge and it was noticeable. I was really grouchy in the morning before, you know, it took me about 30 or 45 minutes to get my mind together. Like nobody talked to me before my coffee and devotionals, you know, but now it was different. It was like when I woke up, I could smell love in the air. There was a peace in my mind, a new hunger for Jesus, a deeper hunger from a deeper place of gratitude because I knew that that thing I was holding on to, he died for that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He died for that too. And he wanted me to be free. Mm -hmm. So That's that good. thing is what propelled me into my destiny and into my passion and into my purpose because for once in my life, I was finally free. And I was free to be the woman that God had always created me to be. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. What would you say to somebody here who's like, ah, oh, I might have something in there. I might have something not dealt with, but I don't want God coming near it. I don't want to tell anybody. I don't want to get prayer. I don't want to talk to, mm -hmm. I don't want to admit it to myself. I would say that it's time. To pray and ask God to show you, because only he can show you those deepest places of your heart where the abnormal has become normal. We've gotten used to holding on to the hurt, the pain, and the regret so well mm -hmm. that sometimes we can't even see it's there. But let me tell you, when you enter the presence of the throne room, God will show you. He will show you that thing that you need to let go of. And once you surrender it to him, you will step into one of the deepest places of gratitude your heart has ever known. Mm -hmm. You will be propelled so far into your destiny that there is no looking back. And you will know that you know that you know that there's a God in heaven who loves you no matter what. Mm -hmm. That very thing could be the thing standing in front of your next breakthrough. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's yeah. good. All right, so we're going to do something a little different now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It actually isn't that different. At the end of every service, we have a time of prayer for people who want to come forward. But it's kind of maybe like a little bit of an afterthought. So today I just want to s just go straight into that time. So in just a minute, we'll officially end and you are free to leave. No condemnation, no guilt. You can head out the door and leave. But if you would like to receive prayer, prayer team, you can come forward right now. Um... Any staff that want to come forward would be great. Elders, whoever, come on down. And then if there's something that you feel like is stuck in there and you feel sick to your stomach right now because you're like, I don't want to go up. I don't want to do that. 
that sick to your stomach feeling is God. It is the Lord. It's him rising up and saying, this is your moment. Come on down. All this has got to get turned into gratitude. And it, it, uh, just so everybody knows, if you come down, if people look at you, they're not coming down necessarily saying they, like, killed somebody or something like that. Some of the, something that we might seem as, like, some really extreme sin. It's, it just means there's something that you feel is stuck in there. I mean, if it was that you killed somebody, all the more, come down, right? But I'm saying what, whatever, whatever it is, it's just you saying there's something in there that I haven't fully given over to God. And I want to, in the presence of another person, give it over. Make sense? All right, so let me pray, and then we're going to just go straight into that prayer time. God, I pray that you would give people the courage to come forward, to get in the light, to share what they've been through, what they've done, what they're going through with somebody up here. God, we know none of us are perfect. We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all come to you in need of grace, and we thank you that you give it so freely. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're all going to stand up right now and then come on down if you want to come down. If you want to head out, you can head out. Ready, set, go.